Thank you all for staying with us. Uh, hope you're going to have a nice night after this one. Uh, can we please welcome Kelly Lee Owens? Hi. So, uh, when you first started, um, I saw uh, something that I read that you were a little bit guilty about leaving your nursing job. Um, did you still reflect on that? Do you still reflect on that now? Yeah, I do actually, because you kind of think, oh, it's a bit egotistical what I do and it's very focused on me. But then, actually, I was thinking about it and, you know, when you play, you're connecting constantly with people and when you create you're constantly connecting with people I had to come back to the core of why I do what I do and I'm just a music nerd music has helped me through all of my life and so if I can just help people an ounce of what music is how it's helped me then yeah there's connection there and so I think yeah it's healing in in some ways and you moved obviously onto a record shop as well didn't you um rough trade was it I've worked in three, actually. Yeah, Rough Trade for a couple of years. Um, Pure Groove was the original one where I met Daniel Avery, Ghost Culture, Errol, Andrew Everall. All are just kind of there. Some of them working. And then Andrew would come in for a cup of tea. Um, and yeah, the latest is Sister Ray. And actually, I only quit there last year, working part-time or like quite sporadically. But... It's been a big part of my life for 10 years. That must have been a good way of meeting those people as well because it's hard to get in touch with those and actually meet them on a face-to-face -face level, right? Yeah, London's like a bit weird. You know, everyone's sort of uh, very closed off at times. And so record store, you're just bound to meet nerds and like really interesting people. And some of them happen to be musicians and everyone's treated equally, you know, like the guys from even like Led Zeppelin would come in to... Um, the last record store I worked at, oh, hey, Kelly, oh, hey, Robert, how you doing? Oh, hey, Jimmy, you know, just casual. What are you doing for Christmas? Oh, I'm doing this, you know. But everyone's equal in that place, and we are anyway, but it's it's really, truly emphasised there as we're all just, like, music nerds. <laughs> was I right in thinking you met Bjork as well? Oh, she popped into the shop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always like, where's the techno section, yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, why does she like techno? And now I just, I think it's fucking hilarious because it's, <laughs> yeah, I'm obsessed. But, you know, that's the thing about music as well is that it finds you when you need it and you can't know everything and connect with everything perhaps straight away and that's okay, you know? And obviously you're in a band as well. Um, how, what was that like? Um, I've always, I always wanted to be in a band. So I ticked that box. But it's a very difficult position to be in a band, um, especially at the moment, um, in terms of like cash and um, creative. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't actually write anything in that band, but it's, you know, there's five people, sometimes five egos, quite strong. <laughs> it's a bit difficult sometimes. But um, if you've got a tight bond, if you're like fused emotionally, I think, um, you can do really well and go far. And what was the transitional period over to your, your solo career like? Was it obviously a lot different, but what was it like for you? Really natural, because I wanted to, always wanted to make my own music. I just wasn't confident enough in doing that initially. So the band was like that stepping stone for me in kind of experiencing things. Okay, I would do this this way. I definitely wouldn't do that that way. Um, so you learn things. I learned more about the industry. I was always kind of in and around it anyway, but you're kind of working directly. Um, in the industry at that point and by the time I left the group I was really ready catapulted like making my own stuff yeah so I know a couple of years ago it's something that's still a hot topic today a couple of years ago you um, you also spoke about festival promoters as well being a little bit lazy with their lineups where would you say it's uh, like two years on well actually I was reading today about Primavera this year it's 50 50 right literally split almost down the middle mm -hmm. and so I think that's amazing and I think that that's hopefully gonna show at least you know other promoters and festivals that it can be done and that the talent is there and I think like I said it, it is kind of laziness in a sense you know people aren't kind of going out their way or perhaps there's still a mistrust that for some reason women cannot operate machinery <laughs> especially in the dance field like I know there's so much incredible female talent but there's still like this been this slight mistrust which to me is just bonkers it's like saying like women don't know what they want in terms of you know producing is knowing what you want producing is like yes the technical abilities anyone can learn that but it's about decisiveness as well I also read that as well. You were very adamant on having your say in the studio and not letting kind of people talk, obviously, in the papers and stuff. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to put your name to something, like, it has to be your creation. Of course, 
collaboration is also wonderful and to have like a person or two to bounce off is sometimes really necessary because you can go a bit mad and you don't actually know if what you're creating is any good. Um, so I've worked with an engineer um, who I've known for a long time and that's been the way for me really and I've learned so much, you know, through him. So that's the thing. I've had like really, really supportive male figures in my life, like Dan Avery and uh, all these people that have just encouraged me, actually. So, you know, also, you know, it's not to be, and anything against men. It's like they've been integral in, in, in pushing me forward. Um, but yeah, ultimately, if you want to be the author of your creation, you have to fight for that. And I think it's important that you do and that you don't compromise on your creativity. Otherwise, what's the point, you know? Did you open a women's, um, like a like a, a boot camp kind of thing? Not so much a boot camp, but kind of like a, a healing thing, is that right? I wanted to, I haven't had time. <laughs> you know, like the ambitious, I want to do this, I want to do that, it's on my list. Um, just to, I, th I think things are popping up anyway now, since I even talked about it a couple of years ago, like all these workshops for women and stuff, just because sometimes for whatever reason, we, we, we lack the confidence and belief in ourselves. I mean, it's representative of society and how society treats women as we're understanding now, and that has affected our psyche. And so it takes us a bit longer to kind of actually trust ourselves, you know, and that's, the only place anyone can begin before um, writing or producing music. And the mental health issue, we just spoke on it briefly before, but what's your take on that with um, gig overload and stuff like that? How do you manage your sort of... With what, sorry? With the gig overload, obviously, we spoke about mental health and there's a lot of um, artists getting booked heavily. Um, how, does, how do you manage your gigs uh, with your agency? Um, so I've got one agency for DJ booking and one for live, and, you know, Really, it's mostly been live that I've focused on the last couple of years promoting the album, and I've been burnt out because yeah. you know you've got your actual, you've got your life, you've got your family, you've got your friends. You're trying to maintain all of this stuff, and I've only just realised like how difficult it is to balance all those things as well as your own well-being. So you have to get rituals in place. This is what I've realised because I lost my voice, for example, twice last year, and I ended up having to cancel shows, which is obviously counterproductive. And so whatever you can do to give yourself care and your body and your mind is like meditation. You can do all little tricks on the road. If you run, take some trainers with you on tour. Like it's small things, but it's things that every day are gonna get you to the place that you need to be in order to to do what you want to do. And that's that's with anything you do in life. You, know? you did a lot of research as well into like music and healing. Is that right as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just because, like I said, I used to work in um, hospitals and stuff, um, but. For me, it's, it's 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 like spiritual, but it's also physical levels. And so gong sound baths and that kind of thing, everyone's like, can sound a bit hippie, but I think more and more people are realizing that it, you know, it actually changes the state of your body. And if you think about everything as being energy, it's kind of, for example, sound can unblock, you know, blocked energy in your body. And so I'm exploring that side of things. And then also just like, of course, like the mental and emotional impact that music has on you and, how it's able to change your emotional state also. And how did you meet John Hopkins? Because he's a bit of a hero. How what, sorry? How did you meet him? We met because we were both DJing at like a, I was gonna say corporate, it was like semi-corporate. It's to do with my label in Oslo and his, my label boss, Joachim, his brother was putting on this um, tech company thing and they wanted some cool <laughs> artists to DJ. And it was me and then him DJing, headlining. And we all went out for dinner and we just sat there and talked about Ableton and Logic for about two and a half hours and no one else would talk to us because they were really bored. <laughs> but um, he was trying to convert me from using Logic to Ableton because he did um, not his last album, the album before on Logic, and then this latest one. He's talking about the creativity and intuitive workings of Ableton. I'm still a Logic girl at the moment, but I do use Ableton for life. I love his visuals. He's like the best thing I saw at Glastonbury was his set a few years ago. I can't wait yeah. for this year. Um, obviously, um, as well with the music, obviously the, your albums obviously been amazing. The one you you did a couple of years ago. Um, what advice would you give to anybody uh, pursuing to try and make that much music to put into a put into an album? How to do it. What kind of advice would you give? Um, just fucking start, basically. Um, I <laughs> It took me ages just to begin and, and say, all right, I'm just going to give it a go, even if it's shit. I have to just start somewhere. And um, yeah, so actually just, just get past your yourself and your self-doubt. Do it anyway. You will be get better, whether that's technically 
of course, intuitively and creatively and have like, say, one or two people to bounce off and say, what about this? What do you reckon? Please listen to this. Give me some feedback, like constructive criticism at least but <laughs> you know um, have good people around you um, get the software that you need to get and learn it like I say with John like he relearned Ableton from scratch it took him <clears throat> a year but he did that because he wanted a more intuitive way of working and so even people who you see you know you think he's super technical he'll tell you he's not like if his engineer is not there and he can't work somewhere he's going home but <laughs> but um you know Ableton he, he, he went from scratch and begun from scratch. And so even people who you look at now, you say, yeah, they know everything. They don't. It's OK. You know, we're all in this together. And and the most the best thing is just to be true to yourself. Never, ever compromise on your creativity and never, ever work with a label that are going to make you do that because it's the wrong label. And same with management and everything else. They should be supporting your ideas, your creative ideas, and your essence, because that's the only thing, your essence, your truth, that separates you from anyone else. Do not look around you and, and you know, of course, you can cherry pick and be inspired, but whatever it is that you feel you want to create, that is it. That's the universe, I think, connecting with you and saying, this is you, this is your path, so trust that. And obviously, I, I, again, I did a bit of research, I think. I hope I did anyway. Am I right in thinking that um, your track was obviously once played at an Alexander McQueen um, event? Is that right? That's pretty huge. Yeah, because um, I'm not published. So, you know, these things don't normally happen to people who aren't published. And so far, I've had, like, Alexander McQueen, Dior, Tom Ford, um, Apple ad recently just come out of nowhere. And the music itself has been the thing that's connected you know, and I had no intention, of course, of there ever being on a runway or anything like that. But um, I stuck to my intuition and my knowing of like what I wanted to create. And I think people can feel and hear that. And yeah, I feel lucky that they want to use it. And you've got a couple of new tracks coming out. I think it's start next month. Is that right? Uh, can you tell us about those? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just uh, been in the studio making a second album. And these are the first two tracks that kind of came out of it. And I knew that they wouldn't be not right for an album, but I just could envision them being a standalone thing. And I kind of was also about to play Fabric for the second time in a couple of months. And I wanted to just make a big banger for, <laughs> for Fabric and test it out on that system. And so Let It Go was like the banger. And then Omen followed after that as kind of being a bit darker and dirtier. And it was actually called Nugget for a while. So it was like Dirty Nugget and, <laughs> and the banger. Um, yeah. And were you at your second album? When will it be, uh, when will it be out? Can't say quite yet, um, but it's it's not far off, basically. So, yeah, I'm really pleased. Has, has, the, has the writing process been a bit different for this one? Have you changed anything from last one? Yeah, in the fact that the first one, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I just made, like, tracks and then another track and then track here and then sort of put that one out, press that one on vinyl. And then eventually signed with a label and then sort of thought, oh, yeah, shit, I need to put an album together. So, And then this one was written in 35 days and I don't I can't tell you how <laughs> it's like a blur um I think it's because I've been on the road for two and a half years and haven't really had time to create and so this is the other thing if you don't express yourself creation which cannot express itself becomes madness that's a quote and and, and it's true <laughs> I was kind of going a bit crazy so I think it all just kind of came out in those 35 days and obviously um I heard that you were well, again, I heard that you were a bit scared of PJ Harvey. Is that true? <laughs> she, for a small woman, she's she is terrifying. I don't know what it is. It's just like the energy, you know. She's kind of she seems quite fierce and fiercely protective of her self and creativity and everything. And I was just quite struck when I saw her. She's got, we've got the same management company, and she comes in and a few other people sometimes. And it was like this big energy, you know. So um, she's a little bit scary, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and any questions for everybody? Anybody so far? No. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, and obviously, do you, um, how do you mix the DJ life to the um, live setup? Um, obviously, I'm guessing you prefer the live one better, but do you enjoy DJing as well? Oh, yeah, totally. I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. That's who I am kind of thing. So it's just, it was a natural progression from making kind of dance, techno into this world. And it's always incredible to just play amazing music, you know? and um, kind of plot that as I do with a live show, kind of build and build and build. And it's just a privilege to be able to to DJ as well as do the live thing. Um, yeah. And will we see you at any other festivals this year that anybody can check out? 
yeah, playing Field Day next week, um, End of the Road, and then I'm going to America to DJ um, in like New York, LA, San Francisco, Mexico, that kind of thing. So, how do you balance like the America side of it? Are they totally different in the way they um, perceive music with the techno side of it? I haven't actually DJed there before, so that's going to be interesting to see how they react because I like what I like and I can only play what I like. So, um, of course, you can kind of read the room a bit, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they react. I mean, live, you know, fans are fans, I guess, so they, they've, the reaction over there generally has been amazing. Um, yeah, so we'll see. And just going on to the festival season, um, obviously, because it's we're in the hot game, it's the high of it now. Um, do you feel it's a little bit saturated and uh, the lineups are a little bit the same? Um, I wouldn't say so, as to what I've seen, but unless I'm playing them, I don't really go to them, so I also can't come, and it's kind of like a busman's holiday, you know, um, so, yeah, I just think I would just, again, push for, like, more women and more representation, and just would encourage promoters and booking agents just to kind of really try to make that a more equal thing, and I think then there's bound to be diversity. And anybody have questions now? Don't worry, it's that time of day. <laughs> have, you, have you not got questions? Sorry, put your hand up then. Sorry, I don't know. How do you like the women playing in town? How does it feel um, from when you were playing in a band to what you're doing now, do you think? Um, I, I mean, ultimately, because it's my creation, I enjoy it more. Um, I literally just like learned to play bass lines and sang with the last thing. Um, it is nice to be the boss, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, there's no one else to argue, you don't have to check if there's like, are you free for us or yeah, no, okay. So, you know, there's all those things. So things run a bit smoother, but ultimately like my dream has always been to um, perform my own music. So really I'm like living my little dream like day by day and I just feel like really grateful, so. <laughs> and just going back onto the fabric thing, obviously it's, it's been through a, a bit of a hell, but um, what's it like playing there? It must be like one of the biggest on us in music, right? Yeah, it's fucking terrifying at first. The first one was with John. <laughs> and like all of our friends came and like Dan was there and I'm like, but Dan, but you're like, you're like you've already been doing this for 10 years, you know? And then John's the same as me. He, you know, was uh, doing the live stuff first and then slowly came into that. But yeah, that sound system, it's incredible. It never, never gets old and... Um, truly honored to play there uh, twice in like three months i just thought wow yeah it's really really incredible and um, what's daniel avery like he did his um falling light show here i don't know if anybody saw it it was absolutely amazing um what's he like uh he's a he's an old pal i call him a dickhead he, he's fine with that um we've known each other like 10 11 years now and you know he gave me his studio to write my first album in so it's a lot of things like thanks to him at the beginning supporting me and with drone logic and working a little bit on the album with him with knowing we'll be here and a few other bits he just kept saying yes to my ideas so in a sense he kind of allowed me to have the freedom and kind of believe that my ideas were valid and so, yeah, I have to thank him for quite a lot. It must be obviously uh, amazing to have those co backings from like people like John Hopkins and, and Daniel Avery. It must be like a bit of an honour. Totally. I mean, because John just basically took me on tour last year and the first ever show for Singularity, he asked me to DJ. He could have asked anyone in the world and he asked me to open it. And I was like, what? Me? Why? I don't know. Um, but yeah, because of that, I think actually people in the UK especially with the live scene, I've taken more notice of my music because of him. So it's, it's everything, having people like that kind of love your music. Anybody else got a question? Anybody else? No? Actually well, I think, yeah, I think we're going to wrap it up there. So can we give a round of applause to Kelly Owens? Thank you. Thanks for coming.